Well, thank you for being here today. Uh, we appreciate the time. And what, what we want to do is give you a little history about Bernheim, a little bit about our current programs, and then talk a little bit how uh, forests uh, also play into human health and well-being. And uh, most importantly, at the end, we'll leave time to take questions because we really want to hear your questions and what's on your mind. And we will talk briefly about uh, Bernheim being under threat at the moment. Uh, so uh, let's get started. Uh, how many of you have been to Bernheim Arboretum and Research Forest? Okay, pretty good. How many of you have been there in the last, let's say, since spring? All right, so does that mean you all saw the forest giants in the giant forest? All right, all right. And uh, thumbs up or thumbs down? Thumbs up. All right, all up on that. Well, good. Uh, for those of you who haven't seen our forest giants, you get a sneak peek at them today. Um, so, very quickly, Bernheim was started by this gentleman, um, Isaac Wolf Bernheim. And he came over as a German Jewish immigrant at the age of 19 uh, with about $4 in his pocket. And he met up, to make a long story short, he made his way down from New England to Paducah, Kentucky. Everybody, you know, immigrates to Paducah. Um, but he made his way down selling Yankee notions off his back. And so you can see him here. This is a famous. Uh, image. It's actually in the Smithsonian Institute, which is pretty cool. Um, and he sold Yankee notions door to door, made his way down here, met up with his brother, and they bought a horse and a wagon. And they started moving whiskey barrels. Well, it didn't take them long to figure out that the way you make money is by filling whiskey barrels. And so they saved their money and they bought an old decrepit distillery, closed down the distillery, and they started the I.W. Harper brand bourbon. I.W. Harper became one of the first bourbons to be sold nationally, one of the first bourbons to be sold internationally, and was a best-selling bourbon in much of Asia for many, many decades. It was recently just brought back to the United States by Diageo, who now owns the brand. But in 1929, Isaac Wolf Bernheim wanted to give back to the people of Kentucky to allow him to live this American dream. And so he bought 13,000 acres of land just way out south of Louisville, way out in the middle of nowhere, all the way down at Bolton at, at, at Nelson County. And this land was decrepit. It was, it was logged, it was overgrazed, it was burnt, it was, uh, had some mineral mining on it. But he knew that nature was regenerative and restorative. And he believed that nature was important for all people. And in 1929, he started the Isaac W. Bernheim Foundation and the forest. And he said that this should forever be accessible to all people, regardless of race, creed, or economic status. 1929, pretty bold, forward-thinking words. And so today, Bernheim is involved with many things, from horticulture to outdoor education to conservation and research activities, beautiful, beautiful arts programs, all kinds of things, including uh, ecological restoration and outreach. Our mission is connecting people with nature. And sometimes that's done very simply. It's allowing kids to be kids outdoors, rolling down hills, getting muddy and creeks, doing all those things that kids are supposed to do, but nowadays they don't always have a chance. But connecting people with nature, we do that in many, many ways. Our vision is to be a nationally recognized leader um, in ecological stewardship that inspires the exploration of our deep connections with nature. Now, I'll spend about three hours talking about that one, and then we'll move on. Uh, but, but in many ways, what it says is Bernheim's a big place. It's a nationally recognized place. It's a, it's, it's, we've won all kinds of awards and, and all kinds of things that often play bigger in other areas than they do here in town. So we're working on becoming more visible and getting our mission and vision out there. Um, but today, Bernheim is 16,137 acres. What is cool is, 
that in that we have a big arboretum of about 600 acres. An arboretum means a place for trees, and we have beautiful collections. It also is a place where we do ecological restoration, we protect ecological services such as clean air, clean water, and wildlife. So 16,437 acres is 25.5 square miles. It is larger than the island of Manhattan in New York. And so what I like to say is instead of millions of people, we have millions of trees. <laughs> uh, again, six, uh, 600 acre arboretum, 8,000 named varieties of trees, or 8,000 trees are named. Uh, many, many varieties out there. It's really exciting, these giant oaks, all the way to beautiful beach collection, European weeping beaches and others in there. Um, and of course, we pay attention to trees and wildlife throughout the year. And here's just a wonderful look at this maple through the seasons. And um, anecdotally, these kinds of temporal studies have shown us that our fall color, for example, has moved back. It, it, our fall used to be the peak of about uh, the third week of, uh, of October. We now say that it's about the first or second week of November is now our fall color peak. And so that's anecdotal evidence of climate change. Um, but one of the cool things is we protect water. When you have uh, 16,000 acres of clean, pristine forest, that's collecting a lot of water, filtering it through those limestone bedrock. And of course, we all know that limestone filtered water is what, um, what's that product made from in Kentucky? Yeah, 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 bourbon. Bourbon, yeah, very important to bourbon. We sit right there on the bourbon trail. Uh, but water also provides a lot of life. Here's a beautiful image uh, on, a, on a trail camera of a river otter that was in one of our streams. And we have many, many more. Um, our edible garden is a relatively uh, recent addition, just about three or four years old. And what we did was we said food draws people. Oh, wait a minute, what are you doing? <laughs> food draws people, and, and it's an easy way to connect people with nature. And so we built this edible garden. It is uh, organic, it is um, really innovative in its use of space and design. It is a Living Building Challenge nominee project. Um, if you know of LEED certification for buildings, this is uh, four steps ahead of LEED. It made LEED look easy. And so it's really a fun place to investigate. And the produce grown there is used in our Isaac's Cafe across the street. So you can't get more local and more organic and, you know, than that. Um, how many of you have been to the Canopy Tree Walk? All right, well what this is, is it comes off one of our knobs, and by the time you're out at that end, you're 70 feet above the forest floor. And you're looking out at just one of the valleys that Bernheim maintains. But the idea is to give you a perspective on what a, a large forest looks like and how it feels from a bird's eye view. It's a great place for watching birds in the spring and fall, by the way. You don't have to crank your neck up to see the canopy. We also do art in the forest, and there's some really fun stuff out there. This is one of our more permanent pieces. It's a giant limestone piece called Earth Measure. It was done by a local artist, Matt Weir. And the fun part is when you, in honor of Barry Bingham Jr., by the way, who used to own the Courier Journal and a news station, and uh, when you walk up to this with this parabolic shape, uh, what you want to do is say, hello, 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 and all of a sudden you get this reverb of sound bouncing off of that shape and coming back to you. If you stick your head in here and say, hello, sound literally travels around that ocular and hits you in the back of the head. So it's really a fun way to experience nature, experience art, and it's a place where we teach uh, science as well. Uh, we do some really fun funky art at Bernheim. Uh, here are Grassmen by Ashley Peaver, a British artist. Those are literally um, sawed that were sewn into costumes. And, and worn by some of our staff. 
it was so much fun for our festival, but they kind of said it was like being buried alive. Uh, this is Whirlwood. It was done by a local artist. This is all Ohio uh, uh, driftwood, Ohio River driftwood. Um, this is, uh, I can't remember. I, I just blanked out on that. And here's one of our giants, um, which is, which is uh, I'll tell you a little bit more. Is that another picture? There it is. Okay. One of our major pieces a few years ago was this willow sculpture by a, a, a nationally known artist, internationally known artist, by Patrick Doherty. And this willow sculpture was large enough that you could literally run through it like a maze. Kids loved it, adults loved it. Lasted two years, and then it started rotting away. So we chipped it up and used it for mulch. That's what we do at Bernheim. We return everything to the earth. And what we try to do is get kids excited about being in nature. And so we have well over 10,000 students who do um, educational programs, formal educational programs every year. And here is a school group in Wilson Creek. What's neat about Wilson Creek is that it's a restored stream. Almost every small stream in Kentucky has been moved. Farmers over the years cut off all those oxbows and curves and they slowly move these streams over to one side or the other of a valley. That way they can farm or they can have cattle out there much more easily than trying to work all those little nooks and crannies. But what that does is it completely destroys the integrity of the stream. <coughs> water flows faster, it disconnects the groundwater, it gets rid of a habitat for wildlife. And so what we did was we took one of these streams that was up against a knob and we moved it back into the valley, connecting it with, with the groundwater again. And it grew up into this beautiful habitat. And today, it is one of the cleanest streams in all of Kentucky because we control the headwaters and have restored this habitat place. So we literally immerse students in nature. When they're out there, they're out here catching frogs and snakes and turtles and all kinds of insects. It's really a fun experience. And many times, students have never been in a stream before, never been in a creek. That's a real opportunity to make a lifelong connection. And we do all kinds of programs teaching nature. We have some of the best interpreters on the planet. We're also involved beyond our borders. Um, here's an example of a green roof that is in our children's play area. But we also manage the green roof on the Belvedere Plaza right here. Oh, thank you. <laughs> uh, this is on uh, uh, Nana Lampton's building, just right, right over, right over there. Um, yes. And uh, Bernheim is uh, managing that. We planted that. We also have one at the U of L Pediatrics building, the Novak Center, and we have a few others. And the reason we do green roofs is because instead of all that rain hitting a roof and running right down in the storm sewers, that rain gets used. And in the heavy rain, it gets delayed a little bit. And that helps with flooding and sewer issues. But also then, that <coughs> sun that's hitting those roofs gets utilized by the plants in this beautiful, beautiful habitat for birds and butterflies. And instead of heating that building, it's being utilized by the plants and the soil itself. And so you save energy in the, in the building. So green roofs are a real opportunity uh, for Louisville in the future. And you're gonna see more and more of them over time. But speaking about management of space, here is one of our prescribed burns, one of our uh, intentional fires. This one happens to be in a grassland. And we do these burns periodically in order to kill the woody material, the woody plants that want to come up in, in these kinds of natural meadows and prairies. Um, but we also do it in some of our forest blocks because we're trying to study what, what uh, affects the oak and hickory rejuvenation. Because oaks in the entire eastern United States are not coming up properly anymore. And some people say it's because of all the deer and turkey eating the acorns. Some people say it's because fire doesn't run through these forests anymore and open up the canopy and the ground for competition. Some people say it's, it's evidence of acidification and climate change. We're testing the fire as part of that theory. 
So here's Wilson Creek again. This was just after we started moving the channels and started planting. This is just a few years later, and we had one of the best engineers on earth come in and build a beaver dam. And beavers are fabulous. There were dams five and six feet tall. And when you hold back all that water, wildlife comes in like river otters and great blue herons and bobcats and all kinds of things. And what's cool about being a large forest is we're home to many, many different species. For example, we house 13 of Kentucky's 14 bat species, including two endangered species, the Indiana bat and the northern long-eared bat. And bats are just fabulous creatures. And many of them are in trouble because of a white nose syndrome that attacks them in the caves where many of them hibernate. Not all bats are cave-dwelling hibernators, but uh, the ones that are are dropping in numbers dramatically. So we're working on preserving bat habitat. Here's one of my favorite. You know, just, isn't this a great lunchtime image? I mean, Ralph and that's big-eared bat. And what it does, instead of catching insects in flight, it literally crawls up and around cliffs and picks off insects as it's crawling around using those ears to hear those insects crawling around. It's pretty cool bat. Um, Bernheim is involved with all kinds of ecological restoration and research. Here is uh, some of the biologists we work with, and that is a golden eagle. It is not a, a, a bald eagle, it is not a hawk, it is a golden eagle. There, there's a small population in eastern Canada, the eastern United States, and we get about eight to 12 golden eagles a year coming down to Bernheim to overwinter. Well, nobody had ever tagged those golden eagles before, and so we did it using these solar-powered backpacks. And every time that eagle flies near a cell tower, it downloads its data. And we can tell where it's flying, where it's stopping, how high it's flying, et cetera, et cetera. So we know, for example, that that eagle soars up in, in uh, rising air columns and then glides for three and five miles at a time. So it's very energy efficient. And what they're doing, here's a male and a female, Harper and uh, uh, Athena. Here's Bernheim. We follow them all the way up to the Hudson Bay in Canada, up there at Churchill, you know, where the polar bears are in the winter. Well, in the summertime, when they go up to Churchill, they are nesting up there and eating Canada geese and snow geese and raising their young. These Harper and Athena, we hope, should be coming back to Bernheim any day now. And so we'll find out whether or not they're a true pair. We, we captured them together at Bernheim and put their backpacks on. So if they're, the first, if they're a true pair, that would be the first pair of golden eagles ever tracked out of the eastern United States. Really a fun piece of research. And by the way, one of the things we found out is everywhere they stop is a large protected parcel of land. They don't like people. Is there a way for us to track them? Is there a way for you to track them? Yeah, we do updates on our website, Bernheim.org. Okay. So you can kind of follow that. We're doing a new tracking system, first one in Kentucky to, to install this system. That's a wonderful uh, uh, little indigo bug tank, by the way. Um, there isn't one? Okay. Um, this is a new little system. So that bird's only about this big. So we can't put a big old backpack on that. So instead, we have a little life tag that's about the size of a postage stamp. And, and we put those on, on the back of the bird and we can track these guys all the way down into Central and South America and back. And so it's going to be a really fun thing to watch how these birds, wildlife, connects Kentucky to the world. And we're going to be able to demonstrate that. Oh, here's, uh, here's little Elena. Uh, she's one of the forest giants. Um, she's the young daughter. And um, she's doing a project. In fact, she's setting out rocks. And we hope she'll be done with that project by about spring. Mm -hmm. um, but what she's lining out is a, is a golden eagle feather for kids to jump on uh, and walk around. Um, this was done by a Danish artist, Thomas Dambo. Oh, 
and here's uh, Mama Lou Marie and Little Nips, the young son up there in the corner. Um, these were done by a Danish artist, Thomas Danbo, came over with eight artisans, worked with 200 volunteers over about a six week period, built all three of these out of recycled, repurposed wood. For example, her dress is bourbon barrel staves. Uh, we have little slugger bats that have flaws, and he carved them into horns and into a throne. Um, so it's really creative reuse of, of uh, wood and tells the story of recycling. And of course, little Nis there is coming out of the forest, looking at his reflection in the pond, in the Olmstead pond, and is saying to himself, how can I be a forest hero? How can I protect this forest? And that's what we want everybody to say. <sighs> All right. <laughs> I'll interject real quickly. Since we've had our forest giants, we have seen a dramatic increase of attendance. Um, we have seen about close to 500,000 people this year since the interview in March. So we're hoping by the end of really our fiscal year, which will be March 2020, we'll have about 800, close to 800,000 people. And this is really just the beginning of, you know, our, we're celebrating 40th, our 40th anniversary of Arts and Nature of Bernheim. So we're going to be picking off shortly some more exciting art, and um, stay tuned. All right, so we do all this under a strategic plan that's four big ideas. And uh, some of those I've been talking about, thought leadership, so we're out there doing research, we're out there working with people around the community, exploring our deep connection with nature. That's those things we do at Bernheim and around. Actions beyond our borders are the green roofs, there are free play activities that we do in communities all around the region, and leadership and ecological stewardship is pretty self-explanatory. But um, I need to tell you that we're celebrating our 90th anniversary this year. 1929 we were founded. But for the first time in those 90 years, Bernheim was facing two external threats. Uh, one of them was a highway study going on. And that is to look at, you know, if you're familiar with uh, 264, the water, the, the Waterson, and then you uh, go out to 265, you've got the Gene Snyder. Well, there was another idea that's being studied, and that is to connect uh, 65 and 71 with yet a third ring. And that giant new Gene Snyder had uh, 12 study routes, and four of them would have taken Bernheim land. And so we started a campaign called Forest Under Threat, and we've been out there doing road shows and talking about this and getting people excited and having them sign petitions and write letters and do all that. And we've been sending off letters by the wheelbarrow full to the Department of Transportation. Well, just recently, the governor announced that that highway study would no longer consider any routes that take Bernheim conservation land. So we're very proud of that victory. However, the second one still goes, and that is, that Louisville Gas and Electric, LG&E, is proposing to put a pipeline right across our conservation corridor, right across our wildlife corridor, which we're trying to build all the way up to the Salt River, which isn't that far up from, from where this map ends. And uh, what they want to do is cut across our, our, our wildlife corridor, put in a natural gas pipeline, which would take down eight acres of trees, create a 75 foot swath of torn up earth, and we would never be able to plant trees on that again. So it cuts off this north-south corridor, creating yet another scar there. There's already a transmission line, uh, electrical lines there. We wouldn't approve that today, but that was grandfathered in way long ago before we bought the land. Today, we have conservation easements on this land, and lg &E is trying to break those conservation easements to put in this pipeline. That means that any conservation land in Kentucky, and one could argue the nation, is further weakened if this conservation easement falls. So again, we've got Bernheim under threat information here um, that, that you can take and get on our website and see petitions and letters and all of that to let people know that you stand with Bernheim, you stand with nature. 
and that you stand uh, uh, for smarter development into the future. One of the uh, interesting things is right in that pipeline's uh, uh, pathway, uh, we did a biological survey of some of the springs that are there. And we found this little guy. This is the hidden spring snail. Now, it's, it's about the size of a pinhead. Uh, I'm not kidding. It's a tiny little snail. But it may be a new species to science. And lg &E wants to push right through and dig up that spring that this guy has found in. There, was no, there has not been another one found alive uh, in 20 years. And so we're doing DNA on this to try to really determine what species it is. It's so rare, it's not even in danger. Not enough is known about it. So anytime you look, there's always interesting things to find in a forest, in an ecosystem, and in a big intact forest is the critical element. And I'm going to let Alicia take it from here and talk a little bit about the benefits of having big forests. So obviously we want to kind of relate it to Humana since you are a health insurance um, company. And something that Mark and I really takes pride in is, you know, we provide health benefits. You may not think that nature is the best prescription, but we are proud to believe that Nature is one of the natural best healers that we can offer. And Bernheim does a lot of stuff between offering hiking. Um, we actually uh, have about two, we clean over two billion gallons of water a year. And in addition, we also have uh, over a hundred billions of pounds of oxygen per year. And that really is within a 25 mile radius of Bernheim. So if you are close to it, if you're in Nelson County, Hardy County, parts of Jefferson County, you are benefiting from Bernheim's clean air, clean water. So just to kind of go back to where our threats are and our conservation, the reason why we really want to protect this land is because we are providing health benefits to our region. We are being a huge provider for that. And we need to continue to support Bernheim, other conservation lands, so we could be nature's best, continue to be nature's best medicine. Another thing that people don't really think about is the mental and physical health benefits. Now, of course, there's hiking, you can go out and explore our more trails, but a lot of mental and developmental benefits come from nature, especially for our children. Today, we see a lot of our kids engaged in technology, not spending enough time outside. I'm sure when I was younger, you know, you'd say, go outside, come home, one and start. We're seeing a decrease of that. And because of that, we're seeing a lot of children have certain uh, mental health impurities due to, most likely due to less time in nature. So you can see stuff um, such as ADHD and ADD. That has been increasing within the last um, 10 years. And we like to say it's correlated to not spending enough time in nature. So Bernheim has really done a lot to help engage children um, getting outside, not just with our nature-based education programs, but with a special uh, network initiative called Children at Play. So the Children at Play is working with a bunch of uh, school groups, organizations, and even healthcare providers. They are um, creating literally a network to train other professionals to teach children about natural play. Now, what is natural play? You might want to think going outside and playing on a playground. But really, that is, um, that is a certain type of play that is directed play. Natural play is when we allow a child to go outside, explore, get in the river, go on climb trees, allow their mental, allow their capacity and their thinking to expand, have there be more risk involved. And when a child and a youth is able to do so, we're seeing a lot less decrease in other mental health disparities. So one thing, for example, is um, we're having doctors literally write prescriptions for children to play outside. Um, so we're working intimately with health providers to get our children to be exploring other places like Fernheim. And Fernheim, our Children at Play Network has um, expanded throughout Kentucky, even into West Virginia, and really teaching children, teaching these teachers how to engage in natural play. Um, one thing that we're really excited about is that we are going to be um, starting in the next 
month building a 10 acre natural playground. Um, it is extremely unique because it will not only be the only one really within, within um, Kentucky, but within the region of this size. Now, what makes it so unique is it's gonna be divided in three different areas, targeting three different de developmental stages. So we'll have our first area, and this is really kind of a rough sketch, but you'll see kind of how it's, it winds up going to be more riskier and riskier, and that's gonna be more devoted to specific age groups. So our hope is that Bernheim will continue to be a leader in um, education and um, children at play, and we'll have other school groups, other um, community organizations, especially children that are in underserved communities, that are, we have a lot of um, uh, supporters within the Smoketown community, within the West End, and we partner with them, and we bring them to Bernheim. Um, but not, do they all, they don't always get the chance to maybe come to Bernheim, you know, we see transportation as being, being a barrier for them. So one of the best things that the Children of Play Network does is they, teach, they allow children to expand their creativity and bring their natural um, play back at home. Going maybe outside into the park across the street, not just playing on the jungle gym, but you see that you can see kids now learning the skills and the, what they were doing at Bernheim. And something really exciting that I actually got to witness is um, with our Forest Giants, we've had such an increase in school groups since then. Um, I saw a kid come with his family, and he was acting as he was the as he was the tour guide because he was there with with his school group learning. And he's like, now, mom, you know that this is from recycled materials, and we can do that just the, the same way at home with our garbage instead. So you're really seeing these kids learn and, and become the teachers. And that's what we take pride with um, our education and with our Children of Play Network. So that is one other exciting project to come to come in 2020 along with other things. Um, but I think it's important that we continue to support Bernheim. Um, maybe it's not necessarily coming to Bernheim every week, but we have other opportunities such as volunteering or you can come take a program or a class. Um, you can do things even in your home that's gonna help support our environment. So getting outside, exploring nature more, is gonna be a benefit to not only to your health, but you're gonna really act as a role model to others around you. Um, so what can you do today? So I have, um, we have set up a special uh, membership offer for all Humana employees um, as a corporate membership. So you will receive a certain a discount as a for a family membership, and that will allow you free admission all year round. Now Bernheim is open seven days a week. We're only closed three days out of the year: Thanksgiving, New Year's, and Christmas. Um, but in addition, you would also be able to explore 300 other arboretums uh, across, really across the country, and even other places in the world uh, for free if you're once you're a Bernheim member. Um, you'll have an uh, opportunity to take a free class, and we have a bunch of interesting programs that are not just for children, but for adults as well. We have a sit and hike coming up with West Six and Mile Wide, um, and we have a great event coming up at the Frasier next week. So it is a great opportunity, and I definitely encourage you to take this brochure here. Uh, if you're interested in signing up today, we have a membership slip to sign up. And then, as Mark mentioned, um, helping us support our current threat with lg &E. Um, we have this uh, postcard here where you can find the website online, learn up, learn our current updates, sign petitions, sign forms, um, and seeing if we're having other in, uh, in any more speaking events. And really, we have found that the best source for supporting us is our community members like you and getting the word out and having your support to burn on the world to us. So we are so thankful to have this opportunity and if you have any questions, please feel free to speak with me or if you want to raise your hand now, we're happy to do so as well. Um, so what are some of the programs, I know you mentioned some of the programs for children, um, mm -hmm. are there adult programs for time? And the, the question was, uh, we, we mentioned some of the programs for children, are there adult programs? Yeah, there certainly are. We offer uh, many adult programs from lunch and learns, uh, uh, where you come and have lunch with one of our naturalists, 
and go on a small hike and learn, you know, it might be trees, it might be birds, it might be whatever, um, all the way to cooking classes from time to time out in our edible garden. Um, and, and night hikes, uh, night uh, sky watches, great way to learn the, the night sky, um, all kinds of activities. Um, we have our course Echo that comes out four times a year. And within that, with, if you become a member, it automatically gets mailed to you. But whenever you come to Burnham or other places, have our um, have our Echo as well. But it lists what the programs are, the cost. Of course, there's the discount as a member. Um, but you can also go online, and there's a whole calendar full of all of our different programs. They really vary. We have, like you said, children, but also family and family programs adults and people for really all ages and honestly one of the best things that we can see people do is come out and just explore Bernheim and one of the best things really about the Giants is where they're located um, it really provides you the best you're experiencing every type um, of land that Bernheim has offered you're in the prairie you're it you're close to our lake you're in one of our trip close to our uh, Trail, trail. Millennial trail. Yeah, so you really, it's, just, it's encouraging to come outside, and sometimes just getting outside of Bernheim is, is the best program. Additional questions? Yeah. Are you all doing any work with like the animal garden or any other parks like that? Um, so, Jeff, so the Olmstead Conservancy, and um, they actually do stuff with like our. Um, Children to Play Network, they have received training from us, but we do partner with those with those organizations as well. Um, yeah, we, we partner with a lot of organizations. For example, we're part of a Salt River Collaborative, uh, which is 27 or 17 organizations, uh, looking at what people can do in the Salt River watershed basin. And so that's about a seven county area, 1,500 square miles, trying to get communities to talk about what do you want the future to be in your own backyards, in your your, your your creek that feeds into the Salt River or right there on the Salt. So we uh, organize with a lot of that. We're part of the American Public Gardens Association, so that's 600 organizations strong. Some of the reciprocal gardens are in that. And of course, you know, we have a cooperative education programs with many others, etc. So we, we can't do it all. We're too small of an organization from a staff size. Um, so that's where some of that thought leadership comes in. We can convene people and talk big ideas and cooperatively reach big goals. Yes? Okay. Well, we're going to hang out for a few minutes. If you have further questions, please come on up. Grab some of our brochures and information. It's a real pleasure uh, being out, out here with you today. And uh, we invite you down to Bernheim, the forest giants await. And if you do want to sign up for membership today, you just have to simply fill this out. I'll take it back and then have a card printed.